All right. Welcome to the Horizon Line, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and pray and open up, and we will get started with some worship. Father God, I love you, and I thank you for today. Lord, we honor you, and we invite your Holy Spirit into this space. Lord, I ask for your help, your sustaining in our lives, Lord, for each of us, in all the different ways that that word means to us and to you. So, Lord, we thank you for that, that you are a good father and that you do sustain us and that your son is here to help us and your Holy Spirit teaches us and guides us and comforts us. So, Lord, we praise you. Lord, I apply a blood covering around about us, above us and below us. And, Lord, every assignment of Satan or any attacks against us, Lord, um, I put under my feet and I disallow them to be manifested in this space. And Lord, I praise you that we have an encryption around about us, that the enemy is not hearing or see us. I strip the communication with the enemy, that we would be in peace and in safety in you. Lord, I ask for you to go before me, go before my words. Fill me up with your Holy Spirit, Lord, and I yield myself to you. I ask for everyone here to feel your fire, to experience your love over them and in them and through them, Lord, as they allow. And Lord, I ask that your presence would be made manifest here. I thank you, Lord, for today. We glorify you and we praise you. And Lord, we just ask for your peace and comfort in this time that we can come together and rejoice in you and we can talk and be safe. Lord, we thank you. We thank you as we assemble together here in unity and in love, Lord, we praise you. And Lord, we ask you to bless this message tonight. I ask for your fire to go before me, Lord, and speak through me. Lord, I ask you to restore, restore to us the joy of your salvation. And Lord, we give you this time. We ask you to have your word come alive for us tonight as we talk about you. Lord, we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We're going to look at some scriptures, but first we will open up to Psalm 5112. Actually, 12 and 13. So I'm going to read both of them for you. And I'll break it down a little bit before I get into more of the teaching. Okay, Psalm 51, 12 and 13. Verse 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Verse 13, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. I wanted to break down this verse a little bit just to kind of give us a little bit of background about what David was going through. And then I will take us from here and we'll launch into the New Testament to kind of bring a fullness to it. So restore to me the joy of your salvation and breaking that part down, what we're experiencing here is that in David's many months of unconfessed sin, he felt the misery of spiritual defeat. He wanted once again, the joy appropriate to salvation to those whom the Lord rescues. And the second part of that is uphold me to your gener generous spirit. And this expresses once again, David's confidence in God for his future. He did not dream of upholding himself. Such confidence is what typically leads even good men into sin. And we're going to talk more about that. And then verse 13, it says, Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. In the dark days before this 
confession of sin, David was not able to teach those who were far from God and saw none converted to him. We don't know if David never made the attempt because of a sense of guilt or if he attempted and saw no blessing on his work. One way or another, getting this right with God was key to effectiveness in his spiritual work. So that gives you kind of a little bit of a breakdown and some context of, of this scripture. All right, so I'm gonna ask you a question. So let's relate this to us now. So have you ever bought something that you were really excited about, did a lot of research to figure out what you wanted, finally bought it, only to lose excitement about it after a few weeks or months? Yeah? <laughs> I do that a lot. <laughs> My most recent experience of that was that I saw some skincare products that seemed pretty good and I thought I would switch over to them. And I did some research on the products and finally bought some for myself because they were on sale for Mother's Day. Yeah, I thought, yeah, well, you know, that'll be fun. So I was so excited when the package arrived and that night I ripped it open and played with all the new stuff. I was like a kid in a candy shop. However, after about a week, the joy of something new had worn off. I was no longer excited to use them the way that I had in those first few days. Why does that happen to us? What makes us lose our joy? Was that even joy? So this example isn't so much of a function of joy, but of something new in our lives. We get easily bored in our day-to-day -day lives, and then we start looking around outside of our relationship for Jesus for things to do or to acquire, to bring excitement or something new to us. The problem is, like I explained in my, my own example, is that we lose interest in things very soon, and then we start grumbling. What exactly are we looking for? Can I throw something in? Sure. Real quick? Sure. More. More. We're also looking for more. Yeah. And suddenly that is not more. It's That's what right. I've already got. That's absolutely right. So we're looking for something or sometimes someone to bring us joy, to bring us more. Because our lives feel dead or quiet, or too slow, we're just discontented, whatever it is, so we're looking for something more. I'm reminded about a pastor at one time teach on this topic, and he was telling a story about how he had his grandchildren come and stay with him and his wife for a weekend. And the International Space Station was going to be flying overhead their area at the time, so he decided to drive out to an open place so that they could all watch it fly over. His grandchildren were all excited about it and naturally had a bunch of questions about living in zero gravity. So they went home and watched several you know, YouTube videos or whatever about it. And from their watching, he noted that one of the people who lived in the ISS or the International Space Station had said that they don't have chairs. They don't, they don't have chairs in the space station at all because they have no need for them. And everyone just floats. And so for weeks after that, he thought about gravity and its pull on our bodies and how we are when we, Holy Spirit likens something, you know, we, he's so spiritually, he grabbed onto that and he likened gravity's effects to how we experience sin and how it weighs on us. As I thought about his teaching and praying into this, I saw people in their walks in life and how as they continue to walk further for, from Jesus, for whatever reason, 
the more they experience the gravitational pull of sin. Now, don't twist it. I'm not saying that buying something is a sin, for my example, or something like that. But what I am saying is that when we start allowing ourselves to try to bring joy in our own might, then we can start getting distracted by outside things instead of focusing on our relationship with Jesus. That's when we're vulnerable. We stop, like Roger was saying, we want more. We stop believing in our identity of what Jesus says about it and we start looking outside of it. I'm guilty of this too. We have doubt. But that's when we're vulnerable and it can lead us into sin. It's a false comfort when we start looking all this outside stuff and we can get deceived. If left unchecked, then sin's gravitational pull pulls us into a different orbit away from Jesus. That's not a comfy place to be. It's really like we're trying to separate ourselves from God, even though he will never separate from us, but it's like we try to separate ourselves from him of our own choice. Why? And whatever we are looking for, whatever we were looking for in that something or more or whatever, it can become our prison. So don't be deceived. Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So the pattern of this world is like that orbit that the gravitational pull of sin has pulled us into. We live in that world and it has a pattern. Think about that. What do you experience in that pattern in your life? Well, here's the effects of it. Isaiah 29, 13 says, the Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they have been taught. That's the pattern. That's the orbit where we do lip service to God, but our hearts are far from him because we're thinking something else is going to bring us our joy. And our worship is based on what? The human rules, the pattern of the world that they've been taught. So it's generational too. So what are these human rules we're talking about here? Culture? Societal pressures? Politics? Yes, all of the above. And it can also look like the music we listen to, the news we're watching, the things we're reading, the people we hang out, social media and other people that influence us, and on and on and on. We're orbiting around that world and conforming to its pattern. It's not helpful to our peace, our joy, or to the joy of our salvation. It makes us forget and we start grumbling. It brings discontent in our lives. All right, now, on a side note, pause that thought, on a side note, there are going to be seasons in our lives that will be difficult. And we will want to try um, something to make ourselves feel better about who we are, about how we're living, our relationships, etc. But we cannot be happy and sad at the same time. They're mutually exclusive. But joy, being a fruit of the Holy Spirit, dwells in the realm of the Spirit and stands in spite of, spor of sorrow. That's a strange paradox, isn't it? It means we can have joy in the Lord 
and have personal sorrow at the same time. And that's okay. It means we have thoughts and feelings. And sometimes they are going to feel like they're dragging us around. However, the joy of our salvation is like zero gravity. There's no weight of sin. We can come to Jesus and give him our sin and the problems that feel like we're buried in. Then there's a sense of weightlessness that comes. That's a picture of heaven. All right, so let's go back to, let's continue on. But just so you understand, it's not like I'm saying, hey, you're not allowed to have problems. We're going to have thoughts and feelings and things, and we've just got to deal with that. But, you know, it's when we leave these things unchecked that it, it pulls us out into this weird pattern of the world. All right, so let's go on. Paul gives us a key to stop the gravitational pull. He says... But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. God has a plan for you. God has a will for you that's pleasing. It's good and perfect. But guess what? Paul's word renewing assumes that we already have or will drift away. He's making a concession for us, right? He's saying, be careful. That gravitational pull will conform us into patterns that are not aligned with God's word. And so we need to renew, renew, renew our minds. Otherwise, we will be squeezed into the image of the world. We'll get pulled into that orbit and it's the centrifugal force of it. And it feels like we have a thousand pounds weighing on us. For David, this pull culminated in adultery and eventually murder. And, you know, maybe for us, we're not nearly like that, but it happens. That's why Paul, or, uh, David said, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. He was done living in the orbit or pattern of sin outside of God's will for his life. Now, additionally, Paul in Ephesians 4.1 calls us to stop the drift. How? By remembering our calling. Ephesians 4.1 through 3 says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of your calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love, and make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Our calling is to be sons and daughters of Jesus Christ, done. That's what we are all called to do and be. And Paul is saying, I want you to live according to and worthy of that calling. So I'm going to expound a little bit there. A lot of times when we think about what our calling is we go, oh, I'm called to be a teacher. I'm called to be a deliverance minister. Or I'm called to be a mom. Or I'm called to be in the business mountain. Those are secondary to this calling. When we first be sons and daughters of Jesus Christ, and we live according and worthy to that calling, then all of those things fall in line. We spend a lot of effort and energy trying to figure out what we're going to do, what we're going to do. Instead, figure out who you are. I hope that makes sense. That's good. Good teaching. Thank you. 
So this is the remedy to stop drifting into the orbit of sin's gravitational pull. Summing this up is that Paul is saying that we will want to conform to the patterns of the world because it's seductive, it's tasty, it's whatever. But we have to have countercultural mindsets. There's a lot of pressure for us to conform to what the world is doing. And right now, what are we experiencing? Everything is coming at everything. <laughs> and what is good is evil, and what is evil is good in the world's eyes. It's so whack. So let's look at his remedy here. So if we go back to the scripture, first part of it says, be completely humble and gentle. Be completely humble and gentle. When you were a kid, did you go, hey, when I grow up, I want to be completely humble and gentle? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> That's not something that's like high up on our thing. Why? Because we think being humble and gentle is a doormat, right? That's what the world tells us that that looks like. Okay, but I'm gonna teach you otherwise. The principle that humility attracts God's favor is all over scriptures. So let me read some of these to you. Proverbs 3.34. He mocks proud mockers, but shows favor to the humble and the oppressed. Matthew 23, 12. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled. So you are proud, you will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. It's exactly opposite of what the pattern of the world says. Luke 1, 52. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. What? And James 4, 6 says, but he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Wait, what? So let's think about some attributes of humble people. Let's, let's use Moses. So in Numbers 12, 3, it says, Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. Now just close your eyes and think about Moses. What did that man do? And scripture is saying he was the most humble person on the face of the earth. He was also one of the most effective leaders to ever live. So being humble is not being a doormat. There's an authority and favor that comes with growing in humility and gentleness. And man, does our world need a dose of that. All right, number two, be patient, bearing with one another in love. This means to refuse to cancel other people. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. The hardest place to exercise patience is with other people, hands down. Just being real. The Greek word for bearing with, and I'm going to butcher this, I'm sure, but it is something like, Anexemai or anexemai. It's A N E X. It's like annex and then I M A I. Anexemai or something like that. Which means, hmm, you're going to love this, to put up with. To put up with. We are called to put up with people's idiosyncrasies, their weaknesses. Their culture and political differences, all of that, and more. Why? 
because we are called to do it, number one. And number two, we're capable because we have more strength than we realize that we have to deal with other people and their stuff. It's not easy. And we want to go, God, what are you doing? But that, what this means is that people, God has brought people into our lives because we can love them through Jesus. He will give us a grace to do so. However, that does obviously, that obviously does not mean any form of abuse, abuse. You will not tolerate abuse. Get out of the situation, put boundaries up, whatever you need to do. But this does not mean to tolerate abuse. Okay, just disclaimer there. All right, number three. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. And that's what Roger had said earlier in the beginning. Keep the peace. So what that means is keep the focus in the right place with people. So we are called to be completely focused on people, not on all of the other stuff that really doesn't matter. Don't focus on what will divide you from others. Sometimes you have to be an agent of peace in relationships. Sometimes you are brought in to mediate, whatever that looks like. But Paul says to make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit. You didn't create the unity of the spirit. The spirit created the unity of the spirit. The spirit created the church and the spirit created your family. And the spirit created this family here, meaning us. Your job is not to create any of that. Your job and my job is to make every effort to keep it together through the bonds of peace. We are agents of heaven and that it means peace. So if you're going to stay close to Jesus, if you're going to find and live out your calling, you've got to live like nobody else in the world's patterned orbit is willing to live because they're all focusing on what divides everybody. And we as believers are sitting here going, um, that looks really scary. I just want to like, you know, maybe go to bed or get out of Dodge, you know, but God is saying, no, you're a light. You have the peace, you have the spirit inside of you that you can go and be a pillar to these people who need to bring love and, and unity together. You, you bring in people and there's going to be dissension, there's going to be disunity, and our job is to keep that unity through the bonds of peace. So, to wrap up, are you willing to join with me to have a radical conversation about God wants us to be and wants us to do? Are you ready, family? Amen. All right, guys. Jesse, I'm going to turn it over to you at this point. Yes, ma'am. Oh, me to throw it down, Big D. Um, anybody got any initial thoughts on rid of the bond of peace and unity and putting up with people? That too. <laughs> I think they go hand in hand. 
What are you saying? Dians, uh, Dians word, the Greek word for annex, annex, brings in my mind a caravan life, once living in a caravan. And we have like a tent attached to the side, which is called an annex. Mm-hmm. Actually, what it is, it, the principle of it is it increases the size of the living area or in spiritual terms, it increases our area of influence, okay? Uh, the thing about annex is it's only three-sided. It has an outside and two uh, and uh, three outside curtains, but there's no curtain between the caravan and the area that it surrounds. So in spiritual terms, uh, we are asked to extend our influence outside of ourselves, outside of our caravan, so outside of ourselves. And we, God has designed us to have a certain size caravan. In other words, the people around us, our family, neighbours, uh, that they're all in our annex or in our influence. And when you live in a caravan, you go outside, really, to to <laughs> get away from being surrounded by you, <clears throat> by you know all your all your stuff you've got in there, and you, you go out in your caravan, uh, out into your annex, and <laughs> most people just have a deck chair or you know some some comfortable chair out there because it's too hot to go out in the sun. In other words, to go outside of that protection that God gives us spiritually as as a uh, annex, uh, we we are able to influence and invite people into that spiritual extension that God has provided for us. So that's what came to me when you were talking about that uh, that Greek word. It was pretty close to an annex. <laughs> That's really good. It's really good. Roger, did you have something you wanted to throw on this? Uh, when she was mentioning the, you have to remember who you are. I remember, how are you phrasing that, Di? We have to live in a way that's worthy of our calling. And we have to remember that we are children, we're daughters and sons of, of <coughs> Jesus before we find out what we're supposed to do. But you'd mentioned we have to know who we are. Mm -hmm. And my immediate thought was our our years of conversations about it always returns to identity in Christ. Mm. Yes, sir. I can go around that block as many times, but I end up in the same place. And that's why... It was so powerful for us to be given that teaching at the time and to discover what that identity was and the grace teaching, obviously. You know, I have to think like, I don't know how many times in life I've had to bridge unity and peace, especially lately when I would have rather been soulish in any other way and operated in separation and division, but yet it has been in my nature and my culturing in life Man, sister. to actually be the humble person. And I actually, as a kid, was in a very turbulent home and actually did was, was a child who wanted to operate and grow up to be humble and peaceful. It actually was an aspiration mm-hmm. of mine. I wanted to be anything but what I experienced in my home life. And so I looked toward all the places where love and peace and humbleness were. And I saw that that's where the light was, you know, that's where people could work alongside each other. And then, you know, as life has unfolded itself, I have found myself interestingly put in positions where I've had to learn to forgive in interesting ways that have taught me more about myself than even the people I've had to forgive along the way. Mm -hmm. And every time I've been faced with a circumstance where there's been sandpaper or shaking, 
and I think it's about the friction in the moment between myself and someone else or observing something that is difficult to watch or experience or experience the outset of. I have had to come up against a part of myself that maybe doesn't know how to partner with the peace that God has provided in some way or, not, or another. And in that way, God has refined myself, my own identity along the way. And it's interesting when we think about like how many ways in which if you let God humble us along the way. And so I guess I, in propositioning a question to everybody, I'm wondering how has God found ways to humble you into learning who you are better in your lives? I've, uh, one of the most profound things anybody ever said to me was a simple admonition, exhortation from uh, our worship leader at a time. And she said to me, let the Lord break you down so he can build you back up. And I thought about it. I said, you know, there's something deep waters about that. That's, that's, there's, for as simple as that is, there's a richness to that, a contextual thing that I needed to unpack for many years. But that's exactly what had to happen. My hypocrisy, my self, just ego, hubris. You know, all that had to be broken down. And boy, I tell you, there were some humbling times of unemployment and whatever it was. Not a whole lot of money to spend. But boy, yeah, I was, I was pretty broken down. And that's what it took to hit a bottom. Hmm. And... You know, and then you come back years later and it's praise reports because, you know, the Lord is building you back up. And this journey doesn't end with just the desperation and hope deferred and all, all that comes with that. That journey is not complete without the victory at the end. And it's interesting how when we're broken down if you look back at the times when we were at our most crumbled places, how loud God's presence was, if you think back mm. to those moments, how present his presence was. I feel like I'm not alone in that. Ooh. And God's voice speaking through people. If your ears found... are there to listen, he was speaking in a thousand different ways. Yeah, that's true. Turn no in no direction, and everything God was speaking through, everywhere and every sensation, through every gate in my life, I felt like I couldn't turn around without God sending me a direction or a sign or a revelation that I didn't quite yet know how to hold. Usually, in those moments, and I. I felt every feeling in order to figure out whatever freedom was yet was about to come in those moments you know christine what would you like to um, say <clears throat> my experience of a 20-year deliverance journey is the way the lord got through to me it was very painful but i had to go through severe physical and emotional and spiritual pain all at once and at the same time have every person of support removed I had, my, I had to lose my job, which I loved, a clinic that God had given me. It was like a bit like Job. I had to have everything removed, virtually every support person that I felt that I could trust let me down or wasn't available, couldn't be available, was removed. And it was absolutely horrific, but it made me have to lean on God. And I had never, just like what you said, I had never been closer to God ever in my life than during that time. Even though it was the most painful time of my whole life, I think I grew closer to God and grew astronomically through the experience, even, even though it was just absolutely shockingly painful. But 
I would never say I wouldn't go through it again because of the fruit, just like you said before. Right. Exactly. Mm. Right. Yeah, yeah, and it seems like the breaking down continues and he just keeps pouring it on until you get that message. <laughs> That's just so reliance true. reliance on me. And if you're pre pretty much a dullard like me, wow, that can be a long time. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, Christine. Yeah, yeah. I think I must be a bit thick. He's had to really lay it on with me. Yep. <clears throat> Big D, what did you want to throw in? Well, I wanted to throw in that the root word of humility is like, it's, I don't know how to pronounce, it's either hummus or humus. And hummus, it's not like the tasty thing you put on chips, but <laughs> it, it literally means dirt. So when we humble ourselves, we're literally, it's like we're going back to what we were creative out, created out of, you know, we're, we're dirt. Mm. And it doesn't mean we're, we're not valuable mm. or it means that that's, it, it, you know, I mean, I think we have to kind of figure out what that means to ourselves. You know, I'm not going to put words in your minds or whatever to think about that, but it's to me <clears throat> in my design, I will say this because I'm, I'm a leader. And I kind of, when I was younger, I kind of fought that. But in my <clears throat> leading, one of the ways that the Lord has brought humility to me in, in that design, in that way, and that's just one avenue of my, of my character, you know, is that I try to find ways to follow and not to lead. Does that make sense? So even though I'm a, a natural born leader and people will always be like, well, Diane, what do you say? And help step up and do this and like take charge. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> I will sit myself down and just say, I'm going to follow this time. And I have to submit myself to other leaders so that I can be teachable. I can learn. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And otherwise, uh, you know, I don't want to lead everything. I have no interest in that, you know. Well, and you're a servant leader. They, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's for me what humility or hum being humble means to me, in at least in that way in my life. I think about the circumstances where these come up in our lives, and the only language I've ever known to really describe it is in some ways, God reduces and refines the moment down to where we are only left with what we partner with. It's refined down to literally the bonds we make. And we begin to partner with things differently because it is reduced down to where we come alongside everything with a new mindset or a fresh mindset or a clean mindset. And he is reducing us down to that sensory layer where we can come alongside with him in an intimate way, step by step and layer by layer in that like completely recessive layer of ourselves. So that everything that's noise gets peeled away until we can literally from the deepest recessive layers of ourselves connect again intimately until we are enmeshed with him and creation in this new mm. construct of ourselves through every sensory gate, even at times. And so, and through our, the fabric of our minds and our hearts, and it, we are taught to like think differently about almost every recessive thought and from a conscious layer to a subconscious layer in those kind of crumbling moments. And I think that's what the function of a shaking period is, you know, the trembling of those things. It's actually to refine out all the residual connections and bonds that we are kind of stuck in the routine of having or need to release and find ways of forgiving. Or, you know, there's all these ways that we have in our Christian, Christian walks with Christ-like minds to be able to release bonds that are not meant for us to have in whatever order that are out of God's alignment. But life is noisy and we don't, we get stuck in a pattern that gets us into a, a posture that's not exactly meant for us. 
And for me, those moments where God peels away the earth <laughs> and I'm left with the crumbling of myself, I do it different. And I've learned to actually like orient around those kinds of moments because I'm usually given a gift with God that I then do life differently <coughs> forever with this new thing. And it, I, you know, some of my greatest like prophetic gifts have come out of those moments, you know, and I think, you know, a lot of your heads are shaking and I'm wondering like, what are some of your thoughts on the matter? Some of you who have not shared yet. I'd like to share. Come on. Um, well, I'd, I'd just like to share about that I've been on a journey for about three and a half years since I retired from being a teacher of um, of learning about being versus doing. Mm -hmm. And it's really about your identity in Christ because I was very busy doing, either in my job or in churches. It's a pattern in my life um, that I've been made to realise. And um, I'll never forget I was in a, in a church and at the end of a the talk they said, pair up with someone and we're going to have prayer. It was in January for the new year, but what you need prayer for. And this lady said, oh, well, what do you need prayer for, Pam? And I said, oh, well, I've just retired. I need prayer about what am I going to do? And she looked at me and said, Pam, I think we need to have prayer about what you're going to be. And I was shocked. Well, that's not what I want to hear. And mm. um, though I've been on this journey about what you just said, Di, about our main calling, so resonated with me is to be the daughter of God. It's our main calling. And um, that's what I've been doing. Not very well, <laughs> but I'm getting there. <clears throat> and um, the fruit that I found is because when you retire, at, you know, from being a teacher, you don't realise it at the time, but you've got this, this status in society and you have this purpose and it's sort of, take it's gone it's taken away from you and people are like well what do you do and you think oh I don't do anything anymore <laughs> and it's really weird it's so mm. weird when you did it for mm. 25 years to get used to that and um so I've been <clears throat> I've had time now to sit at Jesus feet and to be involved in prayer ministry with the gratis group and the fruit that I've found is that the prophetic anointing has grown and mm -hmm. it wasn't possible before because I was too busy, too busy doing, too much headspace and running a preschool and all the rest of it. And I had to, I was doing, what do you call it, the Martha, the Martha thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I couldn't even switch off at night. I had trouble sleeping, the whole bit. And it's, so I've been on that, the, the journey of being humbled I take away my status to sit at the feet of Jesus. And um, one of, the other thing about the, the patience, learning patience, um, I was working with disadvantaged children from ages three to five. And I would have people comment about how patient I was with these children. But the truth was inside I was not patient but I was on the outside doing it. I was getting paid to do it and I had to be professional and suck it up and, and I would do it. And what I discovered, this little gem here, is that when you're not feeling it inside, when you start to do it, do you know you get better at it? You get better at being patient. So that then it started to change inside and it was natural to be patient. Mm. It's, it's the weirdest thing, like... Yeah, that's that's how you grow in patience is by doing it. But um, anyway, I just wanted to share that that's my my journey of learning to to just be a daughter of God and not putting the pressure on me of performing. And then the fruit just flows. Yeah, and I think that as we 
ponder what just that being looks like. I know for me, when I think about that, I start going, you know, like I, I close my eyes and I think of Jesus. I think about Father God and I think about the Holy Spirit and what they're capable of doing and what they've done and what they will do. And it blows my mind and it kind of whacks me a little bit. And then I go, and that presence is inside of me. Who <clears throat> can stand against me? You know, and when you start really thinking about your power, and it's not about me or you in <clears throat> as an individual, it's about what we carry, you know, and whose we are and that kind of thing. And so there's a humility in that, that like, you go like, wow, God chose me. Why? <laughs> that escapes me. It's baffling to me, you know? And, and you go, but that happened. And I think that's, I think when we really start letting ourselves explore the unlimited nature of God, then it starts really truly going, now I can see how what Arthur was saying, it's like what I, I was muted when he was talking about the annex and expanding your space. It's like it's the tent pegs of the tent where it's expanded. There's a there's a uh, Roger. Do you, know what, do you know what that word is? That pictograph that that Hebrew. It's the tent peg where your, your, your mm. tent pegs are expanded. But what basically what it is, is that God is that God of expansion and abundance, and there is no lack in him. And so when we start becoming fearful or whatever, that means we're focusing on the outside stuff and not focusing on what's inside of us. And I think that's, for me, that sort of encapsulates or or helps me distill down what I feel about being a daughter of, of God. So anyway, just my thoughts. You know, Pam, when you were sharing, I couldn't help but think about that. I can't, I can't remember how to say her name right now, but there, when I first became a Christian, I read this book about uh, what, like Con Connie's something boom or something. That lady when the, in the Holocaust who- Corey Ten Boom. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, she's another example of like, I grew up, obviously reading like tons of stories like hers that I saw how I could survive anything and still embrace joy and still do life filled with light. And I used to look up to those stories so I could figure out how to do my own life. Obviously that's how, how I came to be. But her story was like this example of, I'm like, well, I'm not quite sure how I'm going to do this Christian walk because I'm not sure where those Christians are. But if she, if she could do Christianity filled with light in the darkest places, well, then I'm sure if I embrace Jesus enough, I'm going to figure it out too. And then, you know, now many years later and many, many, uh, many interesting gates later, <laughs> I can honestly say, you know, like, I don't, need stories like hers anymore because there's like all of you guys like every one of you guys are stories like hers you know it's like i i look at all of you every one of you and i think i have no question about why god chose all of you to be daughters and sons in the kingdom doing your life the way you do going through all the things that you do choosing to walk filled with light, doing the things you do on the good days and the bad days and the rise up days and the messy days. And I think it's such an honor to like come alongside anyone as much like Jesus as I possibly can to learn how to love them better through whatever it is to do life along the mess until we get it right, you know, and, or at least better. And it's just interesting how in the greater world, we look for these like extreme examples, but in the mundane of everyday life, these examples exist everywhere. You know, it's like, it's interesting how God will use a major crumbling to show us who we are. But I wonder how often everywhere around us every day, he's showing us who we are all the time. You know, like the awe of God is always trying to tell us who we are. I think, you know, 
<laughs> my goal in the next <laughs> for the next for the rest of the year i don't need a major crumbling to find out who i am <laughs> I can, I can, God can tell me who I am without the major crumbling. I can tell God without, without having to be broke down first. <laughs> like, I don't have to go through a, betray, a betrayal gate in order to figure out what I need to hold. He can just hand it to me and I'll just hold it because he done said hold it, right? I'm mm -hmm. like, yo, I don't have to be the upset child that, you know, makes it difficult for God to do God things. <laughs> <laughs> but and I'm you know I'm 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 a better daughter because we've me and God have wrestled it out. But you know I'm putting a little humor on it. But I just I just want to throw that on there that like you know you, every one of you guys has these like incredible. We have those brief moments where we look back and we think, oh, that's the time God broke it down and taught me the thing that set me free, or taught me mm -hmm. who He was, or taught me who I am that made life different. Mm -hmm. But I'm th I'm looking at all of you guys every week, and I think there's not a week that goes by that you guys don't teach me something about myself that makes me a better person every day. I see the awe of God in every one of you guys every single day without a major epic event, as if it's a major epic event. You want to know that God wants to show you who he is, not who you are. Who he is, and he uses yep. people like us to show them. exactly. He's what he is like. You guys are imagers of God. Yeah. yeah. So we'll see your smiley face. I mean, you know, I try. Also. I can. <laughs> I, I I can see God's joy in you. So. Mm. It's not your joy, it's God's joy that, that flows through you. So I see another aspect of God. I was, just... I was a mechanic a mechanic at God's throne room once too, Arthur. I'm, I've been humbled. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm the comedian in the throne room, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> we got something in common. Yeah. <laughs> I see a wealth of spiritual knowledge in Jess, a wealth of spiritual knowledge that you've learnt the hard way that you give out to others. I, I feel like you guys are all teachers. Literally. And I want you guys to know that inside yourselves. In fact, Diane and I's greatest wish is for you guys to know that you don't need us, that you guys can teach us. We wouldn't like to do without you, though. <laughs> you don't plan on going nowhere, Christine. We're right here. <laughs> good, we good. We want you to teach us. <laughs> we yes, we, you guys. we need that aspect. Mm. Need that aspect, each one of us being a different aspect of God, and we just need each other so much. Mm. Yeah. 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 It reminds me of a story. I was in a clinic with this old black guy. He was a fantastic pianist. He was probably easily 70s. And he was telling the story that when he listened to somebody play a ballad, a slow jazz ballad, he could hear all the decades of practice that went into that as each little component of this playing is perfected from the time to the harmony, to the what, the voicings, the whatever. And that's true of you people as well. I can hear the years of experience coming through, the breaking down that Christine was talking about, right? the sandpaper rub of Jesse, right? And that comes through in a maturity level that you couldn't have found any other way without going through those hardships. Mm -hmm. You know, and as a student of the Old Testament, wow, all those patriarchs went through exactly the same thing. Arthur, you were just going to say something. Yes. Um, one of the main themes of your teaching I picked up was Free will. Free will is the most powerful thing God created. 
and placed in all of us. And free will is a choice or a function of our existence. And you were talking about how you look out and see things that are confusing and things, but if you look within, you see you see God and his aspects. Okay. That was a function of your free will. Mm -hmm. you, you chose to look in, not choose to look out. Mm -hmm. And in life, we, we, we're all the time bombarded by situations that are out of our control or uh, <laughs> are a consequence of a decision we made. Uh, <laughs> so your example of, of buying, buying something and then enjoying it for a couple of weeks and then putting it away you know that was your free will mm -hmm. in again you're like after the two weeks you decided with your free will that this was no longer uh, you, entertaining or whatever <laughs> <laughs> so the world system is well go look for something else yep. to replace it whereas we don't have to we've we've got We've got a constant um, love that's like the sun shining on us all the time. That, but we choose. We have to choose to look at what what God is saying or what God's love is. So, so like for me, it's like a vibration. It's like like a heater <laughs> within me. I can feel it when I want to, or I can ignore it. And again, that's a function of my free will. Yeah. It's God's grace. God's grace, then, you know, you get all those questions about God's grace. Should you be going on cruises to Hawaii and all that sort of stuff, you know? Right, right. <laughs> yeah, the good idea. Yeah. Like, well, anyway, I, I do want to throw another question on the, the roundtable discussion here about what what does the term bonds of peace look like for you guys in in for yourself maybe talk about some examples where you've had to broker that bond of peace with somebody or what you think about what that looks like going forward anybody have any thoughts on that start us off my Initial thoughts when I think about the bonds of peace are basically the like major topic of honor. I think about the ways in which no matter what community of people you're in, there's always this relationship with honor, whether there's a lack of it or needs more of it, or there is an act like an active exchange of honor between whoever is in the room and there's whether it's any aspect of creation there's a, an, a relationship with honor whether you're honoring the ocean or honoring a tree or honoring your home or honoring someone else or honoring your children or honoring you know a pet or honoring god or everything there is this relationship where honor comes in and in my understanding of peace that when there is peace there is always honor they literally come alongside each other um and i am not sure if they are separate things or if one is the verb tense of an open atmosphere of the other meaning honor is an as an action a stewarding of a peaceful exchange and peace is the outset of something that has been stewarded in balance meaning there has been an honor that has been stewarded across the bridge of connection and i think about all the times where honor wasn't in, in the room you know and my will wasn't respected and or someone else's will wasn't respected there was a violation that took place in some way or another and how big of a truth in my life it has been to make sure that I steward honor. And I've, I've just, 
in a lot of ways, whether I wanted to or not, ended up studying honor throughout my lifetime because I cultivate spaces with honor in, in the room only because there's been so many places where honor wasn't a part mm -hmm. of the equation. And so I've spent a lot of time trying to make sure that I'm honoring even the people that I come out of relationship with, whether it's through an unfortunate circumstance or not, I still try to honor people, mm -hmm. even when there's been a dishonoring act, I still try to act and function in honor in order to end up, even if I have to break a relationship and actually separate and go through division and separation, I still try to do that with honor so that peace can still reign in that action. If God wants to move me away from someone, I still need to honor mm. that between us in order for peace to exist. I still have to honor the separation of the two things and that that person has, has a right to dominion and will and authority in their life and that I just need to be at a distance that allows me to have authority and authorship and sonship and my own dominion and my own walk. And there is honor for me that might not be up close in that in that person's walk, you know, and I, I, think, I think when I think about the bonds of peace, I don't know how to do it without thinking about honor. And I think there's a million ways the conversation can easily go dark when you when you mention the word honor. But I think the the challenge of being a Christian and walking with Jesus and being filled with Jesus and being an imager of God. And this topic today is can you steward relationship where the outset is unity and peace regardless of whether betrayal, deception, shame, guilt, any of those things has come in the middle, even if separation or division is a function of that exchange, but can peace still be the outset anyway? Can you honor your enemies through forgiveness and a walk out that God has a plan for you and for them and still create peace, even if there's disagreement? And that's what I think about the bonds of peace is, is that we have a we have a duty to the entanglements that exist in creation and to steward them with honor, regardless of the outset of how they land. Yeah, I, I think a way, practically speaking, how I would approach trying to honor somebody that I completely disagree with. Let's use an example of like um, a political persuasion or something like that. Something that they're very dead set on and I could just be kind of like, whatever, you know, kind of like I'm not super... But I, but I have a, an opinion, even though I'm not dead set on that opinion. And so like, if they start talking about something, let's say they're really into conspiracy theories or something like that, and it's kind of fringe or out there or, and I just kind of want to like roll my eyes, you know, I'm just being real, you know? So sometimes, sometimes those kinds of things, when they're telling me they're, perspective on something and I won't even bother to try to defend my position because they really don't even want to hear it. You know what I mean? And so I kind of go, you may be right. <laughs> and it's a way to broker that peace because, you know, I don't want to focus on what's going to divide us. Um, you know, I'd rather focus on like, I want to honor you with your opinion, you know, so what are you going to do? So, Dee Dee, you It's gotta... choosing your battles, isn't it? It's yes, choosing your battles. very much so. And, yeah, I think and just let it go. To, yeah. yeah. Mm. You have mm. to, you know, as we get more into cancel culture and all of these, mm. you know, all the division that's coming in, we're going to mm. have to pick our battles. Some mm. things we're going to have to die on that mountain, and other times we're going to be like, you may be right, <laughs> you know? So... Mm. It Teresa, I was wondering if you would like to talk about what you put up in the chat. I think yeah, it's that's really, really good, Teresa. Yeah, it is. Um, I just realized uh, there were times I had a very tumultuous childhood as well. We would have times of um, you would what I thought were peaceful times, and looking back, because nothing was ever worked through, children were not allowed to really speak up. It was definitely the 
be heard and not seen and uh, seen seen and not heard. And um, then realizing I had taken that into my own family as an adult as well, even in, uh, after I became a Christian at 28, I still was just a really nice person and wanted everybody to get along. And I realized that finally uh, with the two by four over the head that nothing was getting resolved. I was not inviting the Holy Spirit in to take control and do his work and bring his true peace. Um, because you can get everybody to be quiet and pretend to get along. And you can, um, even in church settings, I think uh, get people to agree nominally to things to so that you can live together, but then nothing's worked out. Right. And then end up with people physically sick, um, spiritually sick, um, when you haven't invited the Holy Spirit in and, and truly, and, and we have to work things out, um, hopefully with his guidance, but anyway, yeah. So I, I'm not always aware even now in the beginning, is this the true, is this truly the Lord's peace or are people just making nice to get along? Um, and we're seeing so much of a lack of that in culture and stuff, especially in Western culture, it seems like that, boy, we can really see the juxtaposition now because people aren't pretending um, to keep peace anymore, right? So mm -hmm. if peacemakers, mm -hmm. we're going to have that false peace that eventually erupts into violence <laughs> even. So, yeah, I don't know if that, uh, you all probably have experience with that as well. So I think there's a ministry where I actually heard the teaching initially, and it was like, not just a light bulb, but like a spotlight was on like so much stuff in my life. So yeah, I was a false peacekeeper by, by far, because I wanted everybody just to get along. And, and I would say I'm a lover and not a fighter, but you have to fight for that godly uh, peace making. The peacekeeping is much easier. It is. But it's also coming into agreement with things that are not godly. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, right. that's it's like, wanna... I'm reminded of a quote by Adrian Rogers that I remember writing it down in the 90s because it was so impactful. And it, I'm paraphrasing, it's better to be divided by truth than united in error. Mm -hmm. And I had to process that for 20 something years before I really came to terms with that. It, Divided by truth. No, 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 no. But united in error? How's that better? So, anyway. You gotta think too that that false peace actually is a way to like quiet prophets. It's a way to quiet the heart of God on the nation. It's a way to like stop our voices from actually communicating truth. So it kind of puts a veil over reality with a false reality in a lot of ways mm -hmm. yeah. diane your um bonds of bonds of peace i see as there's two types of bonds a bond as in say rope tied around you and you're tied to peace what holds what holds you is either one god's love or control mm. That's the difference. So when when we talk, talk about bonds of peace, God's love is to bring peace, whereas control is you, you're forced to have peace or you want to control the situation to have peace in your own life. So just yes. your end. Mm -hmm. mm. That's like what Teresa is saying, the difference between the peacemaker and the peacekeeper, too. Yeah. As soon as you said that, I thought of that, those two titles. of like, oh, yeah, okay. One is a form of bondage and one is not. One is actually love. So, yeah. Sanctify the trading floors. Yeah. I just thought it's where Jesus said he came not to, what is it he said to divide? He came and there would it would cause division when he came. So we still have to speak truth and it might divide us from people even that we love. So we have to make sure that's not in our flesh though, that we are truly walking in love in those situations. Yeah. Very true. Well, Jesse, should we move into communion and then wrap up or? No, I believe so. Okay. Great discussion. Thank you everybody. 
really enjoyed it. I learned a lot and it is amazing. You guys are all so smart. Does anybody have any other thing that they want to throw in before we start the music? And get your communion elements too. Well, I'm wondering if this bonds of peace, how we started this conversation with, with this atomic bonding, if there is Jesus's bonds of peace in the very nature of and fabric of our universe, let alone us. And when that peace is released, it will self-destruct. Hmm. There is a way to pray a synchronicity prayer. Hmm. All right, well, I'm going to pray. Father God, I love you. You know what? I don't want to pray. Would somebody else like to pray? Is anybody else interested in praying for our communion time? Anybody? Anybody? I just want to, it's that lead or follow thing. I'm giving somebody else the Come on, Arthur, you want to you wanna do yeah, it. Yeah, I was, I was going to do it. Right? Yes. <laughs> Coming in to save the big D. Do it. I think he's the ideal candidate here. There you go. Uh, yes. Lord, we, we come to you now uh, around your table, along with the disciples, not really understanding what's actually happening, but thinking that we're doing the right thing and that we're doing your work. But, Lord, you, you, you reminded us that unless we drink of, drink of your blood and eat of your body, that we're not in your kingdom. And, Lord, we, we, we come now this, this morning as, as your body and we, we, take of your, we take of your body and we take of your blood and know that we are part of your family that we are being adopted into your into your into your into father's kingdom and we thank you that what you have done for us is so awesome and so large that that your sacrifice was for billions of christians of billions of people that father wants in his, in his family and we just Humbly come and say thank you for what you did for us. Amen. Y'all, we're going to release today. We're going to pray and send us out. We are in love and honor, and I think the night has come to a close. So, everybody, we bless you. We honor you. We love you. We thank you for all that you threw in today. We bless your lives, we bless your homes, we bless your families, we bless your identities, and we send you out into the world to do good things and, and, and think differently about the bonds of peace in your lives. I want to add something real quick. Christine, I just want to pray for you, if that's okay. Oh, it'll be lovely. Thank okay. you. Mm. So, Lord Jesus, I hold up Chris to you. And Lord, I just speak to her lungs and her respiratory system, upper and lower, Lord, that you would heal both of those systems, Lord. And that, uh, Lord, I release your dunamis power over Christine in the name of Jesus to heal this cough. Lord, I just speak death to any infection or bacteria or viral or fungal infection, Lord that is trying to take up shop in this, any DNA or some type of damage that's been done to the system. Lord, I just speak life and healing and, and bring that back to original design for Christine, Lord. I thank you and I praise you, Lord, that by your stripes she is healed. And Lord, we just agree, we agree for Christine's health. And Lord, we mm -hmm. lift her up to you, Lord, that you would bless her and keep her and protect her Lord, 
She needs the breath of you, Lord, in her lungs, Lord. So we just mm. speak the breath of Yahweh over you, Christine, and we agree with your healing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank well, God bless you, Christine. So we'll, we'll keep you in prayer this week. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Mm. Lord, we thank you that you will count us worthy of our callings and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power so that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified and we will be glorified in him according to the grace of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. We love you guys. Have a good week. We will see you all next week.